Good morning. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, if you're joining us live, thank you. And if you're watching this later, welcome. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. And um, today, um, I, as you can see from the slide, we're kind of back to somewhat normal. And uh, we're going to be doing a um, the Christmas story, but maybe not how you've heard this before. Um, more from a historical understanding, more from a perspective of overall what it meant that he came. Um, not just like the Luke story itself or the Matthew, you know, of, of Jesus's birth and that thing. We're going to talk about that. Um, but maybe a little different than, um, you, you might be used to. Um, but we're going to cover a lot of stuff today and, and I'm kind of, I'm really excited about it. Uh, and again, you know, during this time, a lot of people are more open to, you know, hearing about things and, um, you know, with 2020 being the way it's been, um, I think people are searching for, uh, answers as well. So, um, but before we get into that, obviously, um, um, you know, if you have questions or you want more information, uh, hit me up, let me know. Um, and just to let you guys know, um, we're, you know, we're still going forward and, and obviously typically we do this live feed on, um, the church's page, but we've had some issues. So we've been doing it on this one and we've had less issues, um, for the most part. So, um, but it, in the new year, uh, we're, we're planning a lot of things, a lot of great things, and I'm really looking forward to the new year, uh, moving forward, a new chapter, new everything. Um, and you know, the, the greatest thing is it, with this idea of, of starting new, starting something great, starting over maybe even, or whatever it may be, essentially that's the Christmas story, right? That's when Christ came, it was hope for us. It was the idea that we could be new. We could be created new. We could start over, right? And there's times in our lives we need that, right? And that's the beautiful thing about you know, the Christmas story, the true Christmas story, you know, the Christ's birth. And um, so before I get into all of that, uh, again, remember, um, Jesus was most likely born in the summer, June, July, something like that, okay? Um, we celebrate, obviously in America and today and in different uh, countries and stuff, we celebrate it in December. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The main reason, obviously, is it coincides with a, a pagan holiday traditionally. And so even though this is not necessarily the correct time of Jesus' birth, it's still a time for us to reflect. It's still a time for us to celebrate, right? And that's the point. That's the key. It, it's not necessarily that it's completely 100% accurate that, yes, it's right now. It's, it's, it's the idea of why we do it. It's the idea of remembering, right? Um, such as you can see over my, my, uh, shoulder here, um, I have the Advent candles up and I know, I know the fifth one shouldn't be lit till Christmas Eve. Um, but we're not doing a live feed on Christmas Eve. So I wanted them all lit, um, because we're going to talk about that today. Uh, we're going to talk about the Advent candles and we're going to talk about, um, the, Old Testament prophecy filled with the New Testament, and we're going to be talking about Luke and and what we can learn as believers, and maybe uh, how to counteract and deal with the world. Right. So all these things based around Christ's birth and coming. And I know what you're thinking, like that's a lot of information. It is. Um, and I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just going to basically do the tip of the iceberg, right? And if you know anything about icebergs, you see about ten percent, and ninety percent of it's below water. Here's the idea. If someone's coming across this and they have questions or they walked away or they're searching for Christ, I hope this starts the answers, okay? I'm not going to answer all the, the answers in depth today. I'm not going to be able to get into all of those things today. If this raises any questions or you want more information, please uh, email me, get hold of me on Facebook, any of the web pages, anything like that. I'd love to have a deeper conversation with you about these topics. Um. One more disclaimer, and then we'll get into it because I have a feeling it's going to be longer than an hour today, but I hope you stay with me. Um, it, it's this ideology. It's this. Um, I don't like using one-liners. Um, I never have 
because I believe as humans, right? I'm human. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Um, I make mistakes all the time. If we use one-liners, we can make those one-liners say what we want it to say. Okay? And that's a problem for us, right? But if we read the Bible chapter for chapter, book for book, it doesn't allow us the same um, ability to make the word say what we want. I mean, we still can, but it, it doesn't allow us to the same amount of freedom as if we use one-liners. But that being said, <laughs> uh, because how much I want to cover today, um, because how much I, I want to really dive in to this whole idea of the Christmas story and what all references and understands and, and all those things, um, I'm going to be using one-liners. I know you're like, what? You never said it. But here's here's the thing, okay? The reason why I say I'm doing the tip of the iceberg is I want to give those searching or that want more information, I'm going to give you where the stories are at. And I might use one line of it, okay? But as always, 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 do your own research. If I give you a passage and it's a one-liner today, right? Because we are, we kind of already talked about how um, I, I don't like using one-liners. And, and those that have been watching my videos or go back later, I, I don't use one-liners. But for today, because it's kind of a topical idea, this Christmas story, and there's so much I want to cover, I, I didn't, I had to. And, and you'll see why I use one-liners. But here's the thing. Every time you see a section of scripture or one-liner, I encourage you, go back. Look up not just the one-liner, but the chapter before, the chapter after. Use today as essentially a bullet point to where you can start a study of the Christmas story, of Jesus, of why we believe what we believe, why you believe what you believe, right? That's the idea of today. Today is not like, this is what scripture says verbatim, right? This is more of a, this is what scripture says. This is where it all lays out. This is how it correlates, right? Because we're in revelations right now where that's, that's our, our, our real study where we're going in depth. Um, you know, line for line, verse for verse, chapter for chapter, book for book, book is Thursday. So right now we're taking a two week break, um, for our Thursday night groups, but we're reading revelation and it's amazing how we can't even get two lines into a chapter without realizing how much it correlates to the old Testament and the new Testament. The Christmas story is essentially that it's so entangled in the old Testament and the new Testament and even foreshadowing revelation. So today, again, even though I hate using one-liners, I'm not a fan of it. I like reading chapter for chapter, book for book. That's what I love doing, okay? Today is going to be a little different in that aspect. I'm going to use one-liners, okay? But again, I encourage you, look it all up. Look up the chapter before. the ch Again, don't take my word for it. Do the study yourself. Look it up with an open mind, right? Again, if you're watching this and you don't know if, you know, if you don't know if you believe in Jesus or the Christmas story is hooey or, you know, whatever it may be. I encourage you, do your own research, but do it with an open mind, right? You know, in research methodology, the idea is you can't go in with a biased opinion. You got to go in with an open observation. So with all this information I'm giving you, even though it's one-liners and it's, it's all those things, look it up, do your own research, but this hopefully will give you a start to all these things. So that being said, the idea is this, why do we, or you believe what we, or you believe, right? And here's the thing as Christians, as people that say they're true believers, those that believe in Jesus Christ, it starts with his birth. And I mean, you can say that, well, it started in the old Testament, right? When God promised, and you're right, it did. He promised it in the old Testament, but it wasn't fulfilled. It didn't come into the flesh, the, the world until Christ's birth, right? That's where it all starts. So here's just a short list, right? I don't even have actually the full scriptures, right? But here's, and here's the thing. There's so much scripture in Old Testament prophecy to New Testament that I, I gave you a basic bullet point to start with as far as Old Testament prophecies to New Testament fulfillment of Christ's birth, okay? So essentially the Old Testament said this, in the New Testament we see Christ fulfill it. Um, so in that understanding... Right here, we have the first one. So Old Testament prophecies foretold, right? So this is all Old Testament. And again, I am not saying this is the only ones, okay? There's 
the Bible, for those that say it doesn't correlate or the Old Testament has no reference or any of those things, um, it all intertwines. It, it, there's so many times I start a study in one sh- a book and I end up in another, right? Because it correlates. It, they link to each other. And when we understand that and how they link, it, it strengthens our faith. It strengthens our understanding, okay? So Old Testament prophecy of Christ's birth, right, starts... We have all of these. So we have Genesis 3, 14 through 15. This is about a child that is promised, right? Psalms 96, the king of the world. Psalms, uh, Messiah, king and priest. Um, Isaiah, again, if you want to know about major prophecies, about events in the New Testament and so on, read Isaiah. The whole thing. Read Isaiah. Um, essentially, when it comes to prophecies, Isaiah is the place to start as far as seeing these things. And that's why you'll see so many things of Isaiah talk about Christ's coming, okay? But yeah, so Isaiah speaks of a virgin will conceive. Isaiah, the darkness turns to light, right? We know the whole point of part of the Advent candle is the idea of we celebrate Christ coming into our world and being light to our world. Isaiah, again, the branch of, just say, and then we keep going. Isaiah, again, the promise-keeping Lord. Isaiah, again, the servant of the Lord. Isaiah, the suffering servant. Jeremiah, the righteous branch. Zechariah, the coming of the Zion King. Now, again, this is just a small section. And again, here's the thing, guys. If you want any of this information, because I'm going too fast or you couldn't write it down, first and foremost, um, I've allowed it on a live feed that you can pause, rewind, even while the live feed's going, and then catch up. But if you want these notes, I am more than willing to send them to anyone that wants them. Hit me up so I know, and I'll be more than willing to send them to you. So you can kind of look up, like, I'm going to go back one. So you can look up these, 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 these Old Testament prophecies and be like, wait a minute. That's fulfilled in the new. Yeah, it is. Um, and again, I understand that there's one lines or one sections because that's where it specifically says it. But when you read these, like especially Isaiah, you get an idea of the prophecy and what it points to. So those are Old Testament. So a New Testament. And again, there's so much in New Testament, Old Testament that correlate, especially about Jesus. But this is where it's fulfilled. So John 1, the word became flesh. Jesus Luke, the birth of Jesus foretold. Matthew, Joseph accepts Jesus as his son. Luke, the birth of Jesus. Matthew 2, the Magi visit the Messiah. Luke 2, 14 through 20, the visiting of the shepherd. Matthew 2, 1 through 12, the visiting of the wise men. Luke, Mary visits Elizabeth. And you're probably wondering here, you're probably like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, I know I went over those kind of fast. And like I said, here's the thing. There was prophecies foretold of what the Messiah had to fulfill to be the Messiah. And I'm going to get to a quote from a mathematician later on. Jesus was the only one that fulfilled it. He was the only one that could fulfill it, right? And the most beautiful thing about the whole thing is how the Old Testament, the New Testament correlate. Everything was answered beautifully. God knew. God had the plan. So when you're looking at these things, it it, I'm hoping it strengthens your faith that you see all of these Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. But Jesus takes it one more step further. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But I really wanted to get um, essentially to the basic understanding of what the Christmas story is all about. And the Old Testament to the New Testament was me trying to encourage you in your strength, in your beliefs, right? So... I encourage you to look at Old Testament prophecy to New Testament. But then you're saying, okay, so Jesus came, great. There's infinite reasons why when Christ came, it was positive. There's infinite promises that are fulfilled through Christ. I picked 10 from Christ's birth of why we do Advent candles, why we celebrate it, why we worship him, why his birth is so important to us. In that moment, um, from the moment that Mary got the news and conceived and to them going to all the plans fulfilled, right? Um, in, in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, I talked about Luke and, and how it talks about how all these things were lining up. God was using, um, you know, 
non-believers and believers to orchestrate his plan, right? To fulfill prophecy that where Jesus had to be born, who Jesus had to be born from, right? God orchestrated it all to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. But in that moment, these are the things that we gained in that, right? Because before that, we had laws, we had regulations, we had rules. And here's the other thing. I'm a Gentile, which means I would be outside the box. I'd be outside the circle. When Christ came, he broke those laws. He fulfilled the law because we couldn't. We can't do it. We're broken. We live in a fallen, broken world. We're not perfect. Therefore, we could never uphold the law of God. But the moment Christ came into this world, he gives us these. Hope, peace, joy, love, rescue, forgiveness, freedom, acceptance, <clears throat> purpose, and victory. So going through these, I kind of just picked one script line of scripture. Again, guys, I encourage you, go read Romans. Go read Romans 15. Go read. Because um, here's the thing. There's so much, there's so many scriptures. Um, Because here's the thing. Notice out of the promises, those are actually some of the candles or what these candles represent, which again, we're going to get to. Um, Like hope is one of the candles or one of the weeks for candles. And hope, there's so many scriptures. Like I'm only, for hope specifically, I'm using two different scriptures, but I'm telling you there's countless. So hope, Romans 15, 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. When we live in a broken, fallen world and maybe we were going through some hard times, right? And here's the thing. As, as, as true believers, we're not, we're not told we'll be, we won't have to deal with pain. We're not told that we won't be hurt. We won't, we're not told that we won't be um, going through hard times or trials, right? That's a false narrative when those are, that's preached that once you're saved, you're fine. It's, that's not true. What we're told is God will be with us. What we're told is he'll give us the strength. He will guide us through it. He will teach us, right? And people are like, oh, well, that's not true. I believe what, you know, I'm telling you right now, if this was true, right, that we wouldn't go through hard times, the disciples would have had the easiest lives on earth. And if you know anything about the disciples, they had the worst I mean, they died horrible deaths. They were oftentimes in prison just for speaking truth, trying to free people from their sin. But they all had this hope, right? They had that peace. They had the joy. Overflowed with hope because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know many of you are like, well, wait, that doesn't make sense. Why would you want to suffer? But it's not suffering when we're doing it in Christ. It's not we have that hope to understand that we live in a fallen world. Next, along with hope, we have the peace. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and application, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart, your mind, in Christ Jesus. So again, this doesn't guarantee us that we won't go through hard times. This doesn't guarantee us we won't, you know, we live in a fallen, sinful world. But what this tells us is if we're truly in Christ, if we're truly seeking God, if we're truly seeking after him, even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of a battle or whatever it may be, we should have peace. Now, that doesn't mean we don't struggle. It doesn't mean that we don't, you know, argue or try and figure out why this is or none of that. But it's that we don't stay in it. And then we start to come back to understand that we have peace. See, the whole point of like the silent night idea, the song, peace on earth, right? Peace on earth, right? The whole is when Christ came, he was introducing a feeling, emotions, a peace, that was never known on earth. See, Adam and Eve messed it up in the garden. 
And ever since then, we were looking for hope and peace. And even though God gave the Jews the law, it wasn't enough. We couldn't keep it. And when Christ was born in a humble situation, in a manger, it ushered in peace for us, hope, trust. It wasn't just a miracle. It's the idea that it was everything for us. It gave us all things that we were missing. It gave us, again, joy. Luke 2 through 12. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. See, it's not just a miraculous miracle birth. When it was pronounced to these shepherds, what was the first thing that they, that they said? I bring you great joy, news of great joy. See, the sin cycle in our lives can be broken because of Christ coming to us. We can have joy when others are fearful or when others are heartbroken or whatever. We can have joy in the idea of who Christ is. Next, we have love. Another promise is love. Like for those that maybe didn't grow up in the best families, maybe that don't have good parental figures or, you know, been in bad relationships or whatever it may be. We have a savior that loves us so much that he came as an infant to grow, to teach, and then to die. And this is what we learn in Romans. And again, there's so many passages for all of these headings, okay? But this is what the Roman one says. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now, mind you, when he says all things, not worldly things, not worldly understanding. This is a peace. This is a... Um, this is a wisdom, like, God, I need wisdom or, or patience or peace or love, right? That's what this is talking about. It's not like, I want a car, I need a car. There's a difference in that peace. Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies, right? Here we go, another gift, right? Out right out of love. He justifies us if we truly believe in him. No one, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or dangers or swords? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Here's what he says, right? Because that's what the world tells you. Fear. Don't do this. Listen to us. Don't listen to this, right? And here's what it says. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us because of Christ's love. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, any, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. What an amazing promise. He came to humble himself to die for us, right? And if we truly believe in him, if we're truly following him, right? Not just, not just, well, I'll keep God in my back pocket. Not that. When we have that relationship with him, when we're growing in him, that love transcends all understanding. And I, I put this up here because this is one of the most famous, obviously, birth, uh, 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 Bible scriptures, passages, whatever. 
which is John 3.16, right? And this is the understanding of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, that's the key, though. We have to humble ourselves and accept these gifts and these promises, right? He promises his rescue. For he has rescued us from the territory of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sin. He's a rescuer. If we allow him to, we're forgiven. But here's the thing. I just want to kind of make this stipulation. Just because we're forgiven doesn't allow us or give us the free pass to keep sinning, right? The Bible is very clear on what's right or wrong. And I know a lot of people have issues with that, right? Because we have to drop our pride. We have to necessarily do things that we say, well, I enjoy doing this. Now I can't do it. You know, that, that mentality, trust me, I understand. But to fully live with that love and that grace and that peace, we can't be who we once were. And part of that forgiveness, and yes, like I mess up all the time. We all mess up, but there's a difference between messing up, repenting and asking for forgiveness and moving forward. And there's another difference in keep messing up because you're like, well, I have forgiveness, so I'm good with it. See, true forgiveness, especially for us, is the idea that we don't have to feel guilty for messing up because we're not perfect, right? Christ came to fulfill the law because we can't do it. We couldn't even keep the law. But it doesn't give us free reign to do what we want because we have this beautiful forgiveness. If anything, we should want to not do the wrong thing and live as God has laid out for us to do, right? God lays out these regulations and laws, right? These, these moral code, this ethic for us to live because he knows what's best for us. It's just like us as parents. We, 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 we lay out this moral compass because we know if our children stray from it, what could happen? Well, it's the same thing. But the beautiful thing is even if we mess up because we're not perfect, that's when we have this forgiveness. And this is what it says. Here's a truth, trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I love this from Paul because you know why? Or not Paul, sorry. Um, uh, yes, Paul, I'm sorry because he wrote to Timothy, um, of whom I am the worst, right? I, I love Paul. I resonate with Paul because I just, the fact that here's Paul writing to Timothy, one of his protégés, and he's saying here, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what he did. He came in, to, he, he doesn't want to come to save the righteous and all those people. He came to save the sick. He's a doctor, so to speak. Of who I am the worst. Paul always said that I'm the worst. And I will tell you guys the same. I sin all the time. I need Christ more and more every day. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy. Right? Because Paul humbled himself. Paul came to him and said, I'm sorry, God. I forgive me. Right? And if you don't know anything about Paul, pretty horrible individual. Pretty horrible. Uh, even to the point where he was murdering Christians. Um, before Christ stopped him in his tracks. The worst of sinners. Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example of those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. See, Paul's saying here, and oftentimes I use myself as an example, because if God forgives me and shows me grace, and if I can go from the person I once was to who I am now, anyone can do it. If God forgave me and I'm where I'm at today, anyone can do it. But you have to humble yourself. You have to work on it. You know, I've been saved since 18, 19. I'm 40. Um, you kind of, kind of do the math. And I'm still learning. I'm still growing. It's a lifelong process. But we can't stick in the idea that we have forgiveness so we can do what we want. We, 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 we have that forgiveness because we can't be perfect. But we should strive to be better and better every day. See, that leads us into the freedom aspect right? There's an analogy um, of a, a team, a scientific team. You guys know I'm kind of a history, science geek, uh, nerd, whatever you want to call me. Um, and they did a study and they had a dog chained up in a backyard. And the chain went, the first day the chain, the dog could go anywhere in the yard, anywhere in the yard. 
Um, the dog was fed. He was loved. He was played with. So those aspects of the study was taken out. But every day they took a chain, a link of chain off the dog's chain. To the point that the dog was happy. He was content, right? He was getting everything he wanted. He was getting loved. He was getting fed. He was getting petted. He was getting played with. But it got to a point where the chain was so short, he couldn't even move. Why do I bring that up, especially with freedom? Just because something's fun, or you enjoy it, or you think, or the world says it's okay. Okay, so just to say that the world says it's okay. Doesn't mean it is. Doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's good or healthy for you. See, people think that the Bible and God and believing in Christ, you're giving up a freedom or you're giving up your right. When in fact, Christ came to set you free. See, people don't realize sin is baggage. Sin is that chain link that keeps getting taken off one at a time. See, you're, 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 you're happy, right? You're in your sin or you're in the world or you're making money or you think everything's going great. You think you're free until one day you, you can't even walk anymore. You can't even enjoy the things you once did. See, you think you have freedom and you don't. You think because Jesus asked you not to do what the world says is okay and follow him and his moral compass that that's being a slave. Or that's not being free. The truth is we are all slaves to something. We all answer to something. Whether it's government, money. We all do. The only person ever to offer us true freedom is Christ. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Here's the other thing. You know, we talked about the freedom aspect. Acceptance. And I know this is probably an, uh, an issue for some people, right? You know, that have either been church hurt or hurt by Christians. Um, and here's the thing. I'm on that boat too, uh, both churches and Christians. But here's the thing. The reason why I'm still preaching God's words is because churches are not perfect. Pastors are not perfect. Christians are not perfect, right? When I talk about acceptance, it's not the idea of you feel like you're a part of a church or a building or, right? Acceptance is the idea that Christ came that all may be saved. All can come to him. Right. So even if you say grew up in a bad home environment, you're not your family doesn't like you. You don't have many friends. Um, the church has even treated you bad. Right. Because, again, they're human. The church is human. Pastors are human. Right. Christ still offers acceptance. And I understand that's hard to understand. You're like, well, wait a minute. If I go to church, I, I get I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about your relationship with Christ. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Christ. See, all are accepted if we choose to humble ourselves and follow Christ. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. That's amazing, right? Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your, our heart, the spirit who calls out. Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Amazing, right? Many all think that you don't have purpose. Right? And and this goes for Christians, people that go to church, and even non, right? I, I think right now in 2020, a lot of people are searching like, what's my purpose? What's my point? What's my, you know, right? The list goes on and on. We all have purpose in Christ, right? We just need to find it. Just because you're not a good speaker or a musician, there's so many, so many purposes for God. Whether it's homeless ministries, whether it's hospitality, whether it's 
honestly, there's so many beautiful gifts. Uh, someone we know um, just understands people. They like love giving gifts. They love loving on people. You know, and some people in a, in a religious institution or a church would say, well, that's not, yeah, that is. That's more important than anything I have ever done. Loving on people, showing them that they matter, being hospital, that's being the body. That's being purposeful. Giving to the homeless, reaching out to them, loving on them, that's purpose. That's ministry. That's God's love. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And lastly, of the ten, victory. And again, there's more promises. These are just ten that I kind of picked. But we have victory. If we truly put our trust in Christ, if we truly follow Christ, we have victory because of him, not because of anything we do, but because our faith and trust is in him and we choose to follow him. We have victory because of him. When the unpreserved had been clothed with preserved and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. So now that I've kind of did the ten promises, I know we're kind of like going all over the place, but I think it correlates. It'll work, right? Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Avon Candles. Now, I know some of you understand it. Um, and some of you have done this throughout the years and honestly may not even know why. Okay. And um, much like I did with the Old Testament to New Testament prophecies and prophecies being filled, I'm giving you an overall basis. I'm giving you like the little bit of the tip of the iceberg where there's tons more to go. Um, not everything I say is going to be 100% like that's this, you know, there, there's more in depth. There's more to answer. I just, I'm giving you the basic understanding of what Advent Candle is about. Right, and that is what's back here. Now, that being said, this can be done a million different ways, uh, depending on your faith base, depending on what church you go to, depending on what country you're in. Um, and that's how I'm going to start this off. But I'm giving you a basis of what the base foundation is for almost for most of them. Okay, um, if you've celebrated this for years and you don't really know the story behind it, if you've if you've um, maybe you're new to church or you've never gone to church. This is the idea, okay? It symbolizes just essentially the light of God coming into the world. But let's get into this. So Advent candles. An Advent tradition uh, will vary by country, like, right, I said that. But the heart behind Advent is similar across cultural and denominations. Um, you guys kind of know I always throw languages and stuff in here. But here's, here's the cool thing, just a little fact if you want it. Uh, derived from the Latin word avitus, the word Advent means arrival or coming. Hey, and uh, here's the thing that's probably going to throw a lot of you through a loop, you know, because you, you may not understand what Advent candles are, but I bet you have an Advent calendar at home. Um, in this instance, it is used to indicate a set time during the month of December, right? So for in America, we do December uh, to remember the coming of the Messiah. I mean, that, that's essentially what it's for. And I'll get more detail here in a minute. So Advent, like Christmas, is a season of expectation. Here's the thing. Not all... Uh, across the world, religious bases, whatever you want to call it, use Advent candles or uh, Advent wreaths or calendars um, specifically for Christmas. Uh, they, they use them for other reasons. And um, sometimes it's the coming of the first Messiah, right? Because they maybe not believe Jesus was the Messiah. And the other times it's the second coming. They celebrate it using waiting for revelations to come to, to fruition. Um but mainly it's used for, the idea is for the hope, the connection, the birth, the foretold Messiah, the promise, okay? The next thing we can know is there are a few historical accounts that put the foundation of Advent as a church tradition, okay? It wasn't, the Advent calendar itself, cal yes, I am saying not candles, calendar, uh, was not traditionally a church idea, but it, around the 4th or 5th century is when the church kind of honed in and said, wait a minute, we can take this 
to fruition. We can do we can take this and, and, and use it. So other traditions use Advent to anticipate like the second coming of Jesus and other things like that. However, most of what we know and practice today, most of it, again, again, there's there's one offs, and again, this is a overall generalization. Um typically we can trace back to the Middle Ages and later 19th century is where we get this idea, the Christmas wreath, um, of what we do today as 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 Christians, as as uh, observers of Christ. Um but here's a little another fun fact for you. In 1851, the first mention of an Advent calendar. Okay, so not not Advent candles, not the Advent wreath or the 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 candle wreath. The calendar was seen in a Les Adverdicts picture book, and in 1839, the Advent wreath first appeared. So again, what's an Advent candle before we get to the next slide, which I'll just put up so you can read it. Well, we know what an Advent calendar is. It counts down the days to Christmas. Well, guess what this is? It starts four weeks before Christmas. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, I think, in the notes. But it starts four weeks before Christmas. And the fifth candle, even though it's lit right now, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, it's there it is. Um, is meant for Christmas Eve, as in Christ's birth, right? That's when we celebrate it, even though it's not in December. See, almost all Advent traditions, the lighting of candles is is a pretty much a prominent feature, whether it's done with the reef or it's done with something like this kind of a stand or or, or that kind of thing. Um, each week, the candles are ignited. And on Christmas Eve, the final, the Christ candles lit. Um, candles and the lights they produce reflect the light that came into the world with the arrival of Christ. That's the idea. That's why candles are used, because as you light them, it's the light in the world, right? Right. We're, we're told, um, you know, this little light of mine, right? You let it shine. Light shines through darkness. That's the point. And that's what Christ did for us. So a little, cause I, this might be another question people have, like you can see our setup. There's three dark purple, a pink and a white. Okay. So the purpose and meaning of the Advent candle, by igniting the candles, the significance is the light of God coming into the world through the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, getting to the colors, there are varying colors used for the candles. Now, this depends on tradition, maybe the way you grew up, uh, cultural understanding. But here's, a, again, and there could be colors outside of this, but the main colors across the board that are used is white and most most time the white is the Christ candle. It's the last one. It's the Christmas Eve one, okay? But there's pink, red, green, violet, purple, rose, blue, gold. All those are used as well. Um, and there are various meanings of the candles, right? So, like, each week we go through, like, um, the first candle is hope and, and that kind of thing. Like, I here's the thing. There's no rhyme or reason. The point is all the same. It points to Christ coming. It points to his promises. It points to his light of the world, right? So different people use different meanings. So there's prophecy, Bethlehem, shepherd, angel, Christ, hope, peace, joy, love, forgiveness, faith, right? And there's other ones out there as well of what each week represents. And the idea is per week, you light it as in remembrance. So like if the first week is hope, you read the scriptures that are based on hope, right? And I just did the 10 promises, so you're going to kind of see how those 10 promises are now relating to the Advent candle. So this, for, for, for us, the, the way that, you know, I've always been a part of it, the first week is hope. So when you light this candle, right, these would be all out. You talk about hope. You read scripture, right? You, you talk about what the hope of Christ is. And that's the idea. So the first one, the first candle is the candle of hope. And I'm going to go through this kind of quick because there's something I really want to get to today. Um, but let's just go through this real quick. So the first candle, the candle of hope, the verse for this. And again, there's there's all kinds of verses. And it, even this, the 9, 6 through 7, go back and read Isaiah 9. Read Isaiah the whole thing. Um, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatest of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing upon him the justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will, will accomplish this. Next, for the second week, 
right? So the fourth week starting out, this will be the third week starting out, would be for the way that I've always done it is peace, right? And this is what it says. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the, av uh, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything. I have said to you, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. The third candle. Candle of joy, right? These are like the 10 promises that I did earlier, right? Kind of pointing from prophecy to Jesus fulfilling. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an indescribable and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your soul fourth candle so essentially today would be the fourth candle right and then on the thursday christmas eve the christ candle the white candle would be lit so this sunday it would be the candle of love you see at just the right time i love this verse by the way Th these two these uh these two lines uh, three lines i i love this one um to me this is a constant reminder of his love for us you see at just the right time when we were still powerless christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? Even though we mock him, and even though we're the ones that sent him to the cross to die, he still loved us, and that's why he did it. So the fifth candle is the Christ candle. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a uh, husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. It's amazing, right? So I actually worked long and hard on this. And I know some of you are going to be like, wait a minute, if this is a Christmas story, right? Why are we, uh, why are we, why are we going to talk about uh, Jesus and other religions? Because typically around Christmas, people are more open to hearing about Jesus. Like, what is the manger scene about, right? Like, because everyone sees it. Um, and I, I wanted to just put this in here um, for maybe someone that comes across this video later, or maybe someone that's like, oh, it's a Christmas sermon. I'll listen. Um, and make you just think, right? I mean, God, the Holy Spirit, he's going to the one that's going to push you and guide you, right? And the more studying you do, the more, again, with an open mind, you're going to seek it after, after yourself. So... One of the questions I had, and, and I've asked people this, and I've talked to people about this, is why does it always seem like um, Christians, you know, true believers, the ones seeking really after Christ, seem like to be the ones under attack? And when I started to think about this, bear with me, um, you know, there's other religions, and I'm not going to name any names. I'm not going to, I don't want to do that. But what I'm trying to say is this. It seems like no other, specifically in America, no other religions are being attacked. They're okay to believe what they want. Well, first and foremost, that makes me want to believe if something is truth and it's offensive because you want to sin and you know you can't sin if God is real, if Christ is real, you're going to do everything you can in your power to denounce it, to, to make it go away. Where other religions may not convict you because they're not real. But here's what I want to really get to as far as Jesus and other religions. As someone that truly believes in Christ, as a Christ follower, as someone that seeks after Christ, right? I read the Bible. I don't believe in Buddha. I don't bring in Muhammad into Christianity. I, I don't bring that understanding into the Bible, right? Because it's not there. And I know some of you are like, wait, I don't understand. Let me get to my point. So if I feel 
and, and some people would agree with me that it seems like Christianity is the one that's being under attack, right? Those that believe in Christ. Where other religions are allowed to do what they want. That to me is like, well, there's obviously something different about Christianity. Moreover, is this chart that I made. And I know it's a lot. And if you want a copy of this, let me know. I'd be more than happy to send it to you. It took me a long time to put together, uh, but it was so worth. It was satisfying for me because it, it made me start to really understand this. Now, there's other religious sects and branches, and this is just an overall view of uh, was it twelve? I believe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, so twelve. So this is just twelve of the major um, religious beliefs, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in our world, in our culture, today, and even back to Jesus' time. Now, here's the crazy thing. All of them talk about and mention Christ in their either Quran or whatever their, their, their book is, right? But following Christ, right? Reading the Bible. None of their people are in the Bible. Just Jesus. Jesus is the only way. Yet in all of these religions, Christ is mentioned or Jesus is talked about. Now, none of them, it's not even a negative towards Jesus. Most of them just believe he was a good prophet or a good teacher. But the point that they're talking about them in their own religious book makes you got to wonder, maybe there's something more to Christ. And I'm not trying to make you believe whatever you want to believe. And here's the thing. If you've listened to any of my stuff, if, if you know who, if you know me, I love uh, talking with people. I love getting information from people. I love history of things. And this is one of those things that, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. If you want more information, I'd love to send it to you. And more importantly, I hope you do your own research. I hope you read the Bible. I hope you read up on these religions and see that they all talk about Jesus. Now, why is that? Why would... The Bible not mention any of these, but all of these talk about Jesus. Now, these are religions that don't follow Jesus as God, but some of them, I mean, some of them are, but you know what I'm saying? Moreover than that, if you want to challenge, like I get the, the and I'm not going to be able to get to today, forgive me guys, I might do a little podcast throughout the week to finish this sermon because I'm not going to be able to finish it today, apparently. Um, Maybe before Christmas, I'll do another little live feed, or maybe I'll do a video and just shoot it out. And if you guys want to watch the end of this, but I'm going to try and wrap this up. Um, and maybe I'll talk about Luke 1 and 2, because that's the end of this sermon um, later. But I really wanted to get to this point today. For those that are searching, or maybe that are on the fence, or maybe have questions, I'm here. I love talking to people about God. Love it, obviously. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to leave with this for those that might be watching that maybe you normally won't or those that are watching and maybe are struggling in their faith. See, I understand it's hard to believe that there was a virgin birth or that there was an ark with all the animals on it or, you know, Pharaoh and what happened uh, with the Egyptians. I get it. But the, the problem is there's even Christians, there's, there's, there's actually true believers that struggle sometimes with their faith because it's, the problem is we live in a closed minded box world, right? God doesn't live in our box. God doesn't live in our world. He made and created our world. So if God doesn't fit in our box, we can't question or understand some of the things that don't make sense to us because I can tell you right now. The past month, my wife and I have seen things I haven't seen personally ever in my life because God just showed up and he answered prayers from in, in such a way that there's no justification from a worldly point of view because it wouldn't make sense. See, that's the faith part. See, the Bible is backed up through Roman literature through historical reference. These are people that hated Christianity. These are people that hated Christ, yet they put him in their literature. Why? Why would disciples decide to die horrible deaths? Why would Christians in the first century that saw Jesus choose to be burned alive or mutilated for something fake? And see, I know you're looking at me like, well, where are all these facts? They're there. Believe me. You just got to look because the world that lives in sin doesn't want you to know truth. They like you living in sin. They can control you 
when you're in sin. When you're freed in Christ because of his birth. Then you start to see things differently. That's why I put this, 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 this together, right? So if there's literature from Rome and if there's literature from other their worldly uh, writers and authors around Jesus' time and, and after that talk about Jesus, there's validity to that. If we look at this, 12 other religions talk about right here. There's other ones that talk about Jesus. Not one of their gods or people are mentioned in the Bible. Because it's focused on Christ. The Old Testament prophecies point to God, point to Christ coming. And the New Testament's about what Christ did. There's no Muhammad. There's no, um, there's no, yeah, just take this to heart, guys. Just take this to heart. Read it. Do the, your own study. Please do. If you want a copy of this, I'm more than willing to send it to you or talk to you about this. Why is it the world hates people following Christ? Why is it that other religions speak and talk about Jesus? It's not a coincidence. So here's the thing. I'm, I'm way out of time. <laughs> um, I'm going to try, hopefully, um, and do a video um, before Christmas Eve. Um, a couple weeks ago, I did Luke one and then I did Luke two perspective. Um, and I, I'm going to try and just do a small little video, maybe 20 minutes uh, to finish this. I'm obviously not going to go into it now. Um, but I was going to end this with the idea of Luke one and two perspective. And what that means is the idea of what Mary and Joseph and even, um, um, John the Baptist all went through and how the idea is that God doesn't live in our understanding and God oftentimes does things that don't make sense. Um, the, the fact that he came and was given, uh, he, um, guys, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I just, with this season, with this thought, with, with all of this, um, God didn't do anything from a worldly standard. He brought the good news to shepherds. He went to a young woman to give birth that wasn't even married. He was born in a cave, essentially. See, if you were a king on earth, you'd want everything. Christ came so humbly. It's not far-fetched to believe the things that happened in the Bible happened, including the virgin birth, when you see how God operates. From a worldly point of view and standard, it doesn't make sense, guys. It doesn't. I can tell you I've struggled with it before in my life. God does not live in our understanding. God does not live in our worldly box. God lives outside of it because he created it. I encourage you guys. I, I hope the Advent candle helped. I hope the 10 things that the birth gives us gives you hope. I'm hoping to get the Luke 1 and 2 out this week to, to really bring home those ideas that the, the story, the, the Christ's birth, right, was everything outside the box. From a worldly standard, it doesn't make sense. But when you see how God orchestrated it and put it all together, it makes perfect sense how it pulled. Because only God being outside the box of worldly understanding could all those things come to fruition, come to place. Know this, guys. Um, I don't know if I'll do a live feed or, if, or just another short video. Know that we love you guys. We hope you have a safe and happy Merry Christmas, by the way. Um, um, and a Happy New Year. If you guys need anything, let us know. Um, I, I am going to be putting out emails, everything's. I'm really looking forward to the new year. I really am. And not just because it's 2020. I can't wait. No, I, Riverview is going into a new chapter. We're going to a new breath of life. We're going into a new evolution and of, of understanding and in depth. Um, just know that we love you guys, your family. If you need anything, if you have any questions, please, please, if you're watching this live and you're not even part of us, send me an email. I'd be more than happy to have any kind of conversation um, through email or call me or, you know, there's, there's different ways to get a hold of me. And like I said, look um, for the next couple of days for Luke 1 and 2 perspective because that kind of should have tied everything together, but I didn't get to it. Um, be with your family. Um, 
Be with the ones that you love. And remember, family is not always blood. Sometimes family is blessings that God gives you. Um, you guys, if you need anything, let me know. If, if you have any questions, please let me know. If you want the notes from today's uh, topic, uh, speaking, let me know. I'll send it to you. Um, hit me up through an email. If I don't have your email, or just let me know and I'll get it to you, okay? Um, we love you guys. I'm going to pray us out. Again, watch for the video to tie, re tie all of this together, unfortunately, because I ran out of time today. Um, but just, just know, even though sometimes people will tell you you're giving up everything to follow Christ, Paul was all the time mentioned how it was all worth it. See, we may think we have freedom. We really don't. We're, we're all slaves to something. Jesus is the only one to truly set any of us free, all of us free, myself free. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to understand for that matter. But I can tell you from the person I was 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Just thank you so much for our, all the things, the gift of your son. God, I know it's hard for some to understand. God, I pray for anyone listening that this was encouraging to them today. God, moreover than that, I pray if they have questions that they reach out. God, I, I love the fact that you found me. God, I love the fact that you were so patient with me. And now that I've turned to you, God, that you help me grow and guide me. God, I pray for any of those watching that if they don't know you, that they reach out to, it doesn't even have to be me to someone to learn more about you. But God, if it's me, let them reach out. I want to just talk to people about you. God, thank you so much for all you do. God, thank you for the fact that you sent your son to love on us, to die for us. Even when we didn't deserve it, we still don't deserve it. God, thank you so much for all that you do for your son, for the resurrection, for the chance to find you. God, we love you so much. And God, thank you so much for first loving us before we even knew what it meant to love you. Amen. Thank you guys. Love you guys. Um, um, and again, if you guys need anything, have any questions, any, please let me know. I would love talking about this stuff. Love it. Um, and just know we love you guys. If you need anything, let us know. If you guys be careful, be safe. Merry Christmas. Have a great and happy new year. Um, and we love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching later if you are. And look forward to a, a small little video, hopefully in the next few days, about the Luke and 2 perspective. Bye, guys.